All across America, incredibly talented artisans make amazing objects the old-fashioned way, by hand. This episode of Handcrafted America brings the artisans. Mother Earth provides the materials. Whoa! In Mountain View, Arkansas, an artisan puts a booming broom corn crop to great use. 45 or 50 plants to be in one good full-size broom. Just one broom? A copper worker in Nashville combines metal with deer antlers to make the most unusual kitchenware. I think of my job as bringing beauty into people's homes. Mm -hmm. Finally, in Hilo, Hawaii, this is the only man who still carves hula drums the traditional way. Work. This is work. <laughs> Talk about a gift from nature. Boom. Boom! Yeah. <laughs> If you handcraft it, they will come. To Arkansas, where a master artisan is keeping tradition alive in his backyard by making brooms. Mountain View, Arkansas, deep in the heart of the Ozarks, has a rich tradition of preserving folk art and culture. For more than 35 years, master artisan Jerry Levenstein has been using traditional tools and techniques to preserve the old-fashioned art of broom making. Incredibly durable and beautiful, Jerry's functional brooms work better than any factory-made version. It all begins with broom corn. You'll have to clarify this for me. Is this the kind of corn that you can eat? Or? No way. It's a type of a sorghum. It's a field crop planted and grown just for brooms. That's it. Right. Broom corn looks like this when it's harvested. All of the seeds are thrashed or removed to make usable material for a broom. What am I looking at here? Well, it's just various lengths and quality of the broom corn material. Right behind you over here is how we purchase it. We go through that one piece at a time, and the best ones with the good quality stock we use as the outside layer. Then we have longer and shorter because they're different stages of the broom. The shorter stuff is the first, and then the longer goes on second. What are you going to teach me how to make today? We're going to make a tall broom. That's the standard broom. We call it a kitchen broom. A kitchen broom. Jerry gathers local sassafras wood in the winter and dries it for more than a year before trimming it down to size. We're gonna make brooms, we need some handles. What am I looking for when I'm looking for a handle for a kitchen broom? The straighter, the better for use. I think we have a couple. See, we're gonna leave all these out. So we would not use <laughs> this. What would this <laughs> be used for? A strictly decorative broom. Yeah, Very unusual wall hanging type broom. This right here is about right. That's pretty good size right there for most people. Rough knots are removed using a bandsaw. Another one. Another one. Ah, another one. I could do this all day, I'm telling you. Now we have to drill some holes in it so we can run our wire through on the end where the broom goes, and then a larger one up here for a leather strap to hang it because that makes your broom last longer if you hang it. Jerry begins adding the first of three broom corn stock layers onto the handle. We use a wire on the inside layers. We can build it uh, good and strong by using wire. So I pull the wire up from that little spool. I'm finishing this layer by adding a staple. Now I trim this down. He tapers the stalk edges so when he adds a beautiful weave pattern, it will flow nicely along the sides. We're done with wiring and now we're gonna weave. On the outside of the broom, Jerry weaves with jute, a vegetable fiber spun into rope. He uses an over-under pattern to create the desired look. Obviously, it takes a lot of plants of broom corn to make just one single broom. How and many plants does it take? 45 or 50 plants to be in one, one good full-size broom. And just broom. one broom? Right. Despite all that raw material, Jerry's brooms start at just $12 and go up to $100. The broom is almost finished, but Jerry still needs to sew the broom corn so it will lay flat. To do that, he uses this antique standing broom press made in 1878. Just clamp it like that and it holds it in place. It's got it spread real even. And the sewing will hold it flat when we take it out of this press. Need to go around the outside a couple of rounds and then pull that up snug. And then to do the stitching, I go back and forth. 
by going out on the top and back in, I make this little loop right here. And then that's what we continue to do all the way across the broom. Jerry uses another antique tool to trim the ends off so they're nice and straight. It's pretty quick. Whoa! Crew cut. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry says the sign of a great broom is one that can stand on its own. Stay. Stay. First time, that's pretty good. <laughs> when people come out and help me, I usually have them do the very last thing, and that's to sweep up the shop. Wow, oh, Jerry. Really know how to sweep a girl off her feet. If I hear another broom joke, it's going to be the last straw. Copper kitchenware seems to have grown antlers. And not only is it beautiful, it's built to last. How long is this gonna last me? Centuries. Centuries? Yes. And last, and last. Imagine having a dinner party and serving your guests with one of these. Huh. Talk about a conversation starter. In fact, I'm gonna go have a conversation with a man who makes them. Nashville, Tennessee is famous for its music, but local coppersmith Ben Caldwell is also a rising star in these parts. His handcrafted copper and antler tableware is hitting all the right notes. These pieces are chart toppers in their own right, and Ben's quality craftsmanship means they're built to last. I think of my job as bringing beauty into people's homes. Mm -hmm. That not only is this something to be used, but it's something that you could leave out and display. Did you always want to get into metal smithing? I originally was a painter and went to art school to study that. Then okay. I built musical instruments for 10 years. But when Ben was about 30, a family friend who was also a highly respected silver and coppersmith began to train him in the craft of metal smithing. It was a very sudden thing, but it, the door opened and I just walked through it. And I immediately took to it like a fish to water. When I'm doing this, I think of the great work that was made centuries ago and just the beauty of a cup, the beauty of a spoon. I have to say, this one catches my eye today. Is there any way that you could possibly show me how to make this? Absolutely, I could show you how to do that. How you start with the ladle is it starts with my template, which is a round thing. You use a permanent marker and you draw a circle on it. So I will rough cut it and then I'll have you finish it out. I will cut this. Watch out. Look out, flying copper. You take okay. it from there and then you can snip it. All right. There you go. I'm make it fly. Ah. There you go. Next, a file smooths the edges of the cut piece. Ben uses electrical copper, which means it's 99.9% .9 pure copper and has twice the thickness of roofing copper. Ben, I feel like we're in a bit of a forest here with all the trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you use these for? These are stumps, and I use this for forming my pieces, and I carve different hollows and forms into the wood so that I can hammer my metal into it. And why stumps? Why wood? This is soft enough that it will not scratch the copper. This is called sinking, and you hammer right along the edge, and you rotate it, and you begin to push the metal down. And then you can go a little deeper, and it will fold a little bit. How do you know when to stop? Well, when it's the right shape. That's the shape that you want. Beautiful. Keep the lip right over the edge, right like that, yep. I don't like those little guys. Get down That's there. That's right, get down. All right, very good. I think we're ready to go on yeah. the planishing now. OK. What planishing is, the root word of planish is to plane or make flat. And so after you've hammered on it, it's all bumpy. And so this is what smooths it out. So you're always hitting in the same spot and just and move just this. And you move the copper. And you move the copper around underneath it. The trick is to pinch it. If it's making a sound like not good. It's not doing anything. It has to make that ringing sound. It has to make the anvil ring. With my apprentices in the studio, I don't even have to look at them. I just have to listen and I can tell if they're hammering properly. 
To get that right ringing sound, Ben uses a shoe cobbler's hammer because it has a good weight and balance for the metal. How's it sounding? It sounded great. Sound sounded good? Very good, <laughs> yep. It's beautiful. When it hit, it gets shinier. Yes, it does. While Ben's copper pieces are undeniably beautiful, it's the antlers he incorporates into them that makes them so unique. Where do you get all of these antlers? I get them from Montana. I have a man who sells me the antlers out there. He goes and finds the antlers after they shed every season. So which antler are we going to use today? I have selected this one, and we're going to cut it and make the handle. We're going to be using this part, which is called the burr. The antler is cut and sanded. Now the antler is ready for the scrimshaw. And when you say scrimshaw, you mean this design right here, which is the flower design? That's correct. I carve it here and here, and scrimshaw is carving on anything that is bone or ivory or okay. corn, things like that. You have to have a steady hand for this. Yes. After the carving, Ben buffs the entire antler, which brings out its shine and depth. Ben's creations range in price from a few hundred dollars to several thousand dollars for his larger pieces. Is this kind of your little trademark, yeah. this flower? It's, yeah, it's a little signature, a little detail that I put on all my pieces. The next step is to secure a stem into the handle that will connect the antler to the ladle. Right there. Nail holes are drilled out. Went down in there like butter. That's right. Smooth. And then furniture nails are used for the rivets since the head is small and easy to secure. There you go, there you go, there you go, Look there you go. It's happening. Now you turn it over and just lay it flat on there and snip it off. And that is how you rivet. Now we have a finished ladle, don't we, Ben? Yes, we do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How long is this going to last me? Centuries. Centuries? Yes. The things that last are things that are made well with hefty materials and quality craftsmanship, and it will last, and that's what I try and do. Ben has most certainly found his calling. He has married his love for the arts with traditional metal smithing, and everything he creates is functional, beautiful, and definitely one of a kind. In Hilo, Hawaii, this is one of the only craftsmen carving ceremonial hula drums the traditional way. What does the diamond represent? Diamonds represent the fire of Kilauea. Lots of stories here. Yeah. In Hawaii, traditions are inspired by all of this natural beauty. In fact, our next artisan makes drums from coconut trees, he says, are sent to him from the ocean. The pahu drum is a key ingredient in the hula ceremony in Hawaiian culture. These drums, made from coconut trees, are masterpieces of beauty, function, and culture. And in Hilo, Hawaii, on the Big Island, Keone Taraldi is one of the only men making these drums their traditional way. Pahu drum is a hula drum. Hula girls are dancing to the beat. Boom, 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 boom. Why coconut tree for your drums? We surround it with coconut trees I in see Hawaii. That. Yeah. <laughs> I see that everywhere. <laughs> yeah, because the coconut tree is one of the best trees that you can have in your backyard. It can give you a drum, water, Coconut milk, yes. coconut oil. Yes. Milk. He only finds his purpose in drum making from tree stumps that have already died. The older the tree, better it is because you got history. How old is this? This tree is like 80 years old, 80 something years old. 80 years old? Yeah. The tree trunks have to dry for over a year before Keone will begin his work. So far, we took the skin off, we did some shavings already, we did some out sketching on the designs. Traditional designs go way back. What does the diamond represent? Diamonds represent the fire of Kilauea, the lava coming down, creating the land. Keone creates the shape of the drum and all of the designs with just a few simple tools. Four gouges, a mallet, a file, some sandpaper, and two hands. The flat always outside here. Keep your hands, finger. Okay. 
Give it a try. Okay, I'll give it a try. When you're done, you shake it sideways. Yeah? Never like this, okay? Always break it sideways. Uh-huh. Okay, let me show you one more. Okay. A little tricky. Okay? Okay, and them then up. you go. Okay. Yeah. Hold this up. Okay. Hey. Look at that, huh? I'm just try to break this in half. But it's so hard to fiber, yeah? Let me see. You see the mail? can do that. It's a little piece of wood. It's... Mmm. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay. See my finger reader? Right, yeah. So it's going to be that white. So you're going to oh. hollow all of that out. Yeah. And it makes the sound... Travel. Louder. Uh, louder. Okay. But the bottom of the drum... I keep them thick, maybe like an inch and a half or two inch. So you have some weight on the bottom. Light drum can be dancing, moving around. But you get something heavy on the bottom, it ain't gonna move. Boom. Boom! Yeah. How long does this take you to go all the way around the drum, all the way through? Maybe six hours. We put the cheese already here, a quarter inch, mm -hmm. and give it a tap. This is work. It's pretty amazing that Keone is able to do work this physical at all. When he was a 26-year-old diver, he was paralyzed by decompression sickness. The only part of his body he could move was his left arm. Keone was hospitalized for four years, and when he got out, he had started regaining his strength. That was when he found that wood carving was good for his recovery. Now Keone has complete use of his upper body, and he can even stand while he works. Some cultures use the entire animal when they cook. In Hawaii, Keone uses the entire coconut tree to make his drums. This is traditional coconut rope. From the actual coconut? Yeah, round coconut. You can make a thousand or two thousand feet long. Keone Tiraldi is a master Pahu drum maker. He carves the ceremonial hula drum out of a dead coconut tree. He carves diamonds, half moons, and waves into the body and hollows out the center. The next step is to make Keone's drums distinctly Hawaiian. So now we are making the bowl, The bowl, correct? yes. There's a bowl on the bottom of the Hawaiian drum, the Papu drums. What is its purpose? The bowl is for keep the sounds in a chamber, like a tank. Keone creates the bowl using the same gouges and mallet. How much more do you have to do on the bowl right now? Maybe two more days. Where do we go from there? When it's done, either we can use a file, file everything down, okay. make it smooth again, and when that's done, we use a sandpaper. After smoothing his drums, Keone uses coconut oil to varnish the wood, bringing out the deep, rich color. And finally, it's time to lash the drum top onto the body with rope made from Wait for it. Coconut. This is traditional coconut rope from the coconut. Oh, I see. The, all these fibers. Yeah, fibers, yeah. What is the top made of? The skin part. Okay, this is like a raw hide yeah, from a cow. Traditional is a shark skin, but you gotta catch a shark. No time to catch a shark. We'll have to stick with the cow hide. The next step in the process is ceremonial, breathing life into the drum. Mana, the ha. The breath of life. I do it like this too, yeah. Bring it all out. All your air. And when you close it, you seal them. You close it up with your ha. Your breath of breath life. Of life. Yeah. You do that because no matter where you go, your breath of life give it to other things. People put in other things in there of their personal. Like actually objects? Yeah, objects. Something to, that means meaning something to them, to them and to their family. This is the lashing part right now. Okay. We already did this lashing over here, so you gotta make sure your ropes come straight down. And just go around first, always go in, and bring it up. Here is one of your finished drums. This one actually has the scales and it has the waves. It looks like this is all about the ocean and the currents yeah. and all of this from a coconut tree. Well, 
The reason why I put this design, the surf and the currents, I mean, when you go down to the beach, you find a coconut in the water. And what happened, the coconut drift onto the sand and the high water line, Mark, and he might stay there for a while and boom, sprout the leaf. And um, that's a reborn of the coconut tree. The ocean gave you the coconut. Thank you, the ocean, yeah, for bringing the coconut to the land. And you celebrate that on your drums. Yep, I, I always that. do that because the ocean is one of a kind. Keone's traditional chant is a tribute to his drums and his wishes for a safe journey. It reminds me of the transformative journey the coconut tree takes to become a drum and the road Keone traveled that led him to create these Hawaiian heirlooms. To an artisan, materials are everywhere. The coconut tree can give you coconut oil. Coconut oil. Use it. Do you hear that coconut oil? They're growing in the backyard, so you can't eat it. You wouldn't want Probably to eat it. Want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> or an animal sheds them in a forest. Oh, dear, Ben, look at all the antlers. That was about the lamest antler joke I've ever heard. Or they're washed up in the sand. A true craftsman knows that nature is the ultimate source of beauty. Got more money inside here. Yeah. Get it in there. Seal it in there. there. Yeah. <laughs>